Hello everybody, welcome back to Duality. I am Bob Dub, your host, and I am joined again, as always, by with Roger. By Roger from Roger Hansen Live. <laughs> hey Roger, how are you? I'm alright. How are you doing today? Pretty well, doing pretty well. It's quite a cold day here. We're sliding down into winter. You're you're in spring now, aren't you? Yeah, it's still a little nippy, but it's not cold or anything. We've had a lot of rain. Right. Yeah, we've had quite a lot of rain the last couple of days. It's getting pretty cold. Anyway, yes, it's actually a lovely day. And uh, welcome to all of you viewers who have joined us. It's wonderful to have you with us. It's so great. Uh, sorry for the delay in starting today. We've had a few little audio issues. But we're going to have a brilliant show today we are going to be talking about paradoxes so i'm sure you know what a paradox is a paradox is two irreconcilable statements or propositions that make up one whole statement so they're often very absurd or contradictory statements like for instance in quantum physics you've heard about people talking about how particles can be in two places at the same time Oh, I'm sure you know uh, Schrodinger's cat, the experiment where you put a cat in a box with some radioactive material, and then you have to think about whether that cat is dead or alive. And in fact, the consequence of the thought experiment is that the cat is dead and alive at the same time until you open the box and find out for sure whether the cat is dead or alive. So we have these very strange ways of thinking and they're very, very helpful, especially when you're thinking about things like dualities. I'll give you another example. The saying, this is the beginning of the end, is absurd and contradictory. And yet we can see that if an ending is not instantaneous, but happens over time, then that ending will have a beginning. So once we start delving into the paradoxes and unpacking them a little bit, we see the huge message in these opposing dualities. Often this message is a religious truth. So one of the silly things, a silly example of it is, I always tell lies. <laughs> From a moral point of view, that's quite a good uh, sort of religious, spiritual way of thinking, to be aware of our tendency to tell lies. But if you delve into it and you see that the person has used the word always, I always tell lies, that means that this statement that I always tell lies is a lie, and therefore I don't always tell lies. In Buddhism, they've got a really great little uh, talk that they that they talk about when they. W w I think the Buddha was explaining the idea of the difference between a person who believes that they are something and have an identity and are a self compared to the Buddha's idea of that like we have no actual self we're just the sort of free floating conglomeration of parts and the idea the image that the Buddha used to explain that it was a king who was asking him about this complex issue and the king came in on his chariot and the Buddha said, well, for me to explain it to you, you need to take your chariot apart. So the king took his, his, his chariot apart into wheels and reins and all the rest. And the Buddha said, okay, so now where's your chariot? 
And he said, well, there it is. He said, but no, it isn't. That's not a chariot. Those are bits of a chariot. So we have these very strange, very mind-blowing ways of looking at um, looking at these these strange truths and understanding how to how to understand the the great secrets of life. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. So Roger, yeah. welcome to the show. What is your opinion of paradoxes? What is your favorite paradox? Uh, the one that I uh, really enjoy is where one, when one door closes, another one opens. Mm -hmm. And that is what really stuck out to me when you were talking there, because I've heard that quite a bit. Um, like, especially, right. especially when I sobered up, like they would say, where one door closes another one opens up um and the beginning of the end was pretty much what i had to go through when i hit rock bottom so that that that's how it related to me whenever i heard those kind of phrases mm -hmm. it's strange isn't it it's it's w when you're in the situation you don't think that there are any resolutions it seems as if everything's so hard and so contradictory. But once you've solved the problem, it all makes sense looking back. Don't you think? It does in the end, but like nothing really makes sense when you when you stop and you look back at everything. It just like it, it didn't make sense back then and it, when you look at it and you see things like from you know, looking back, there's there's situations that happen where you stop and you think, man, you know, what the hell happened? You know what I mean? It's like uh, Chris Farley in that one, uh, what was it, uh, where his brother was a politician and they sent him out to the country to keep him out of the public because he was really stupid. And, uh, <laughs> He was, he was standing on the top of this cliff and he slips and he falls down and he's like grabbing all these branches and everything trying to stop himself from falling and he kept falling and by the time he got to the bottom his feet popped up and he was able to stand up and he took his hand and he smacked himself on the head and he said what the hell was that about you know yep does that make Ex sense? It makes exact sense. It sounds like my life. <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's pretty amazing when you stop and think. That's kind of how I interpret a lot of that stuff because, like, yeah, um, I, it would it would be great if everything makes sense. But sometimes, you know, life, what what you want in life isn't exactly what you're gonna get. You know what I mean? Like it's sometimes the things you wanted in life wasn't what you needed so right yes exactly that is so weird hey that is so weird okay so when you were telling that story mm -hmm. i was thinking about the paradox of suspense when when you when you're hearing a story you wonder what's going to happen next. And the good thing about a story, one of the good things about the story is that the, the, the punchline, you know, you mm -hmm. watch the movie because something's going to happen. However, it's really interesting in the paradox of suspense because if you watch that movie again, you will still have that same feeling of suspense despite the fact that you already know <laughs> what the end is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's uh, as if our bodies just remember things and act on our past experience, hey? Well, a lot of what we've been discussing just, I mean, Chris Farley just bounces right in my head you know because like he seemed to be one of those persons when it came to paradoxes you know what i mean because like mm. 
in his in his shows there were uh, situations where y- you you were like that you were on on watching the show and you're like man I don't let that happen or man you know what's you know you, you get that suspense so yeah yeah it, like there's a part in black sheep where uh his partner the little little blonde headed dude freaking uh owns a car and he was supposed to pump gas so mm-hmm. uh when he gets out of the car and he goes in to get a map Chris Farley freaking goes to pump the gas and he couldn't reach the gas uh, thing with his the gas uh, line so he's gonna put it in reverse and back it up but he forgot to close the door and when he backs <laughs> up the door bends forward you know and every time I see that part there's a part in my head saying close the door close the door <laughs> You know, and I know that it's not going to happen because I've seen the movie like 50 times, you know, but I still freaking just want them to close the door once, you know. When I was, when my kids were really little, I used to have, I used to do aftercare, after school care for working moms. So I used to pick up their kids with my kids and take them home and look after them for the afternoon. And once there was this little boy, I don't remember his name, but he was the cutest little five-year-old. You know, one of those little boys who just looks like a teddy bear? And mm-hmm. you just want to just... Uh, he was too cute. And um, he listened. He, he he came to my home and he listened to the story of... The, I had the, the, the cassette tape of the little gingerbread boy. And, you know, the, the little gingerbread boy runs away from everything and then... He, and then he 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 tries to get across the river and he can't get across the river but the fox comes along and says like if you jump on my back then i'll swim across the river and take you over and the little gingerbread man says don't be silly i know you just want to eat me and the fox says no no i don't so the gingerbread man jumps on his back he swims into the river then he pretends he's sinking and then he eats the gingerbread man anyway this little boy listened to the story about 20 times and he came to me and he said the gingerbread man never figures out that the fox is going to eat him doesn't matter how many times i listen to the story the mm-hmm. fox is still going to eat him mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> that, that's kind of <laughs> like yep. that's kind of like the snake and the kangaroo yeah the the it's in the middle of winter and a kangaroo's hopping along and he looks down and or she looks down and she sees a a snake freezing in the on the ground and the Mm -hmm. snake looks up at her and says please please put me in your pouch so that i can warm myself up she says no i know if you put me in or if you, I put you in my pouch, you're gonna bite me. And she, mm-hmm. he, he goes, no, I promise, I won't bite you. And uh, she finally agrees to do it. So she puts him in her, in in her pouch, and the snake ends up biting her. Well, after he bites her, she goes, why did you do that for me? You were freezing and ready to die, and I was warming you up. And he says, yes, but I also have to remind you, I'm still a snake. <laughs> You know, so, yeah, it's amazing. That reminds me of the Stockdale paradox. The Stockdale paradox says that you must never confuse the faith that you will win out in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever those might be. That's another thing, you know, we have to be able to look at this brutal reality that the snake is still a snake Mm -hmm. and all the compassion in the world won't change the snake from being a snake. And yet it's still important to be that compassionate person that you care about the snake that's freezing to death. You might not want to put it in your pocket, but you, you, you can't lose. You know, you can't lose the ideal even when you're confronting the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's a really crazy uh, saying, but a lot of people say it. And it's true if you think about it. Everybody hates hearing it, but it says if you walk like a, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. 
Yeah. 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 So. It's similar to Occam's Razor, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think what Occam's Razor says the simplest and most obvious solution is generally the solution you're looking for. Yeah. Well, that yeah. one's kind of like don't overthink it. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> that, that's yeah. exactly it. If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. It's a duck. Indeed. Indeed. I Indeed. usually put a cuss word in there so it sounds cool, though. <laughs> Just makes me feel better. <laughs> Emphasize. <laughs> yeah. Em- so, em- go carry ahead. on. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to change over. I was just going to go on to the next one. The observer's paradox. That the outcome of the event or experiment is influenced by the presence of the observer. So the fact that you're there and you're looking at the thing and you're noticing that it's walking like a duck and it's talking like a duck. In terms of quantum mechanics, you looking at it makes it into a duck. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of ridiculous, really, because we know that looking at things doesn't make them become those things and yet in a, from a mathematical point of view you know mm-hmm. the outcome of, of an event is influenced by the presence of the observer well they've actually done the split experiment and found out that, mm-hmm. that is actually true like have, did, have you ever heard of the devil split experiment yes i have but remind me of it it's when they fire particles into a into a wall that has two slits right now, now these these particles when they go through they're supposed to uh go into the slits and they'll leave traces of uh, right. the particles behind it they actually found out that when they did it okay uh if nobody was there watching or a camera mm-hmm. wasn't on the uh the thing watching Yes. And they weren't watching. However, they did the experiment where they they found out that it it, it was it, the particles weren't behaving the way they were supposed to be. <laughs> like like they weren't there. It, they had to have somebody to watch them in order to get, to, to do what was expected. Which is I thought was weird. It is so weird. It is so weird. I can't like there's a part of my brain that just refuses to accept that reality and mm-hmm. keep on trying to think of like what could it be about observing something that changes it it's it's strange i I, it's tr- I still want to do more research onto it i dabbed a little bit into it but i didn't go the whole way on on the yeah. subject but it, it really is interesting and they, well, I was researching it as well. Maybe once we come to the end of this series of shows, we should switch into looking some more in more depth at some of those, because it's it's really fascinating. Honestly, it's unbelievable, mm-hmm. and it does make you wonder. It makes me wonder whether it's sort of evidence for God, like if the universe couldn't be here unless somebody had looked at it and and made it be here. Then what looked at it? You know, mm-hmm. what is looking at the universe to make it here? Well, yeah, for me, it kind of goes back to that old saying. Um, everybody's always bringing up if a tree falls in the wilderness mm-hmm. and you're not there to hear it, did it make a sound? You know, did it make a sound? Yeah. So, I mean, it's that I, I think a lot of people have been curious about that stuff and they, they have come up with a lot of different things too like now they're talking about uh the same frequencies that make up the web the internet is all around us so we could be just a part of a virtual matrix yeah yes exactly and it looks really really more and more and more as if we are just part of a virtual ma- matrix but the weird thing is, Roger, it seems that each person has got their own virtual matrix. And all these millions of matrices all seem to just join together somehow. A connection. You're connected in, in uh, a network with the wonderful world of weirdness. <laughs> so like... 
there is no sound at all, ever. Because isn't sound only something that happens inside our heads? Well, sound is vibration. You gotta understand that. Like sound. Well, the vibrations exist. Yes. You see, vibration creates everything when it comes to like everything. I mean, even like the the particles that are moving through the table that you have your computer on. If those particles mm -hmm. stop moving, you could literally put your hand through that table. Yes. You know. Um, yes, exactly. The movement of particles in the earth is what prevents you from falling through it and going all the mm -hmm. way through the earth and eventually into space. Mm -hmm. So these vibrations are what makes things solid and they're what makes things yes. not solid. But vibrations, okay, so there are sound vibrations, right? And they mm -hmm. do travel through the air. But they don't make any sound when they're vibrations. They not, only make a sound if they hit something. Not, not if we... I mean, we can't hear it, but, I mean, what if they are making a sound? I mean, and they're, it's just too low for us to hear. You know? There's, there's a lot of different factors that you can take into consideration. Like, there could be noises around us right now going on that we're just not capable yes. of hearing because they're too okay. low. Roger, if you cut off our ears, right, uh -huh. we wouldn't be able to hear any vibrations at all. Oh. So hearing something, you have to have ears to hear something. Oh, no. There's no there's no sound until you put an ear in in the path of that vibration, for the mm -hmm. vibration to hit the ear and make the ear send the sound to your brain. Mm -hmm. So basically, the sound doesn't happen until it hits your ear, and then nobody else can hear it except your brain because it went into your ear. Well, it it depends on what you uh, consider sound. I mean, for me and you, yeah, we can say that, but what about a deaf person who uses his hand to touch a speaker in order to fill the music? You know, I mean, is uh -huh. that... You know, I mean, you mm -hmm. you, you got to think of stuff like that too. So, but that's not sound, is it? Vibration. I mean, that would be sensation, of vibration, but it's not actual sound. I mean, what what is it to them though? I mean, are they hearing it in their mind? Mm -hmm. are, are they Under hearing it? Do. You know. Well, I know your body feels vibrations, like when you go to a concert and you feel the vibrations from the speakers. Mm -hmm. You can actually physically feel your body trembling from those sounds. You, even, you, yeah, even if your ears are blocked off. Yeah. It is weird. It's it, so it's it's a really good question. I mean, I wish we could talk to somebody who was deaf. And, and, wow. You know, that would That's actually be a good. Uh, question to ask them you know what is it they feel whenever they do that mm -hmm. when they touch mm -hmm. speakers so that they can feel the vibrations of it mm -hmm. you know it would be fascinating to know that anyway okay so we're going to go, go back to to paradoxes for a moment we'll have to line up another show on that but for <laughs> okay. today let me talk to you about the demographic economic paradox right oh god this is going to i be know fun. <laughs> nations or subpopulations with a higher GDP per capita are observed to have fewer children even though a richer population can support more children. Isn't that weird? We've done everything in our power to make ourselves richer so that we can have more children and then we've stopped having children. <laughs> I've actually checked into that though, not the uh, economics part, but like uh, about uh, reproduction. Yes. No, no, there's two things that are really important and one is self-preservation and the other one is, or, or actually it's survival and self-preservation, but the other one is also immortality. 
Now, when you use the term immortality in this topic, you're not talking about one person living forever. You're talking about the the continuation of the species, okay? Mm -hmm. So, with immortality, people have a tendency of uh, not producing as much whenever they are in a safe environment, whenever the environment is... Uh, like tropical or freaking good uh, safe environment where they don't have to worry about it. Now, mm -hmm. when a person is in an environment where they have to worry about survival and taking care of themselves and, you know, the elements taking and killing them, they have more of a tendency to freaking procreate and have sex. So, you you right. think that it would be the opposite, but it yes. really isn't. It's people who mm -hmm. have to really survive, like especially people in cold weathers who are afraid of freezing yes. to death. You know, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. have more of a tendency of procreating than what a person in the tropical islands eating coconuts and living yes. high on the hog does. Yes, absolutely. And your kids are likely to live until they are old. Mm-hmm. Whereas in those poorer countries, you know, the coconut countries, you've got to have like 10 children to make sure that three get to old age. Mm -hmm. It is weird. Okay, here's another one, similar but different, okay? okay? In countries with income sufficient to meet basic needs, the reported level of happiness does not correlate with national income per person. So, the more expen you, you would expect that the richer a country, the more happy the people are. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what they found is that as you get richer, your levels of compassion decrease and you become more and more dissatisfied and unhappy. Yeah. How weird is that? They get greedy is my, my bet. Most of them. Like I've I've always said that a lot of people they uh they they overlive their means. You know what I mean? You don't have to have like two go uh, two car garage and and you know three cars because you got a kid who's just hitting sixteen. That's nonsense. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, you, yeah. you you don't have to have all that stuff. The basic necessities for any human being is a head over or a roof over their head, food in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. pay the bills, which is electricity, mm -hmm. freaking yes. utilities like gas and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever other bills that you need. But all that other stuff that's those aren't needs those are freaking wants and i think people have a hard time understanding what their wants and their needs are absolutely you yes know. yes so. exactly and, and, and it's strange and, yeah Kara. and they think they're happy they'll they'll be happy when they get this stuff but when they get it all of a sudden they're swamped with bills and they don't understand why you know yeah yeah, so. yeah. It's true. It's so strange how your mind tricks you. I think that's one of the reasons why I love the Buddhist idea of staying in the now. Because your mind tricks you about what's going to come in the future and sends you all these fantasies and imaginations. And it tricks you about what happened in the past by misremembering and, 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 and confusing things. And the only thing you can really trust is your experience of this instant, this now, this moment, you know, being mm -hmm. here. Now, there's uh, the, prepa the preparedness paradox that says, when you prepare to avoid a catastrophe, and you therefore lessen the damage that's coming with the catastrophe, then after the catastrophe, you say, oh, well, it wasn't so bad, because look, we lessened the damage. <laughs> yeah I, I, I find that with the whole COVID thing that we've just had you know when it first started and all those hideous reports were coming out of Italy mm -hmm. and all those 
those pictures of the nurses who had their masks on and and then everybody did all this stuff to change what was happening in the pandemic changed it and now we look back and say well it wasn't that bad and it wasn't that bad but we also intervened mm -hmm. okay we also made it worse in some ways right yeah. but it's just what i'm saying is that at the beginning it looked really scary from a lot of the things people were saying and then it turned out to not be as scary afterwards i think it, a lot of uh <clears throat> a lot of things are fear-based like uh you, you was talking about faith, you know, where there's fear, there's, there's, there isn't faith, and where there's faith, there isn't fear, is what a lot of people say. But mm. I also know that like fear is also a healthy uh, thing too. It's not good to run around without a little bit of fear. You know what I mean? It keeps you, it keeps you from freaking the gorillas attacking you because you don't freaking have the sense in your head if it can be afraid of them. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, so You absolutely. want to run out there and club them. And, you know, a gorilla is like 10 times stronger than you. He's going to beat the crap out of you. <laughs> so. And if you don't fear him, you'll be dead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's actually like saving your life. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's a healthy fear, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, there's just some things you don't do. You, you don't jump up and get all courageous because freaking you know that's what you're supposed to do if you know that something's dangerous and you're there's something in you that makes you afraid you need to at least recognize recognize it and then determine if it's a healthy fear or not like should i yes. be afraid yes yes you know? absolutely yes or, sh or how should i act because yeah. i'm afraid right. because you know there are unhealthy ways to respond to your fear. Like right. you say, it'd be all like, I'm, I'm so cool, I can deal with this, I don't need to be afraid. And then, yeah, actually, did. Yeah. need to be afraid. Yeah. 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 It was like, you, you, you don't, you don't go into the, for, into the projects to, with the carload of Bibles and try to freaking spread the gospel to a bunch of gangbangers, you know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. a good chance they're going to shoot you. A good chance, unless you want to go straight to heaven, because or, yeah, well, that, that that could be that could be the motive, you know. Yeah, I mean, shortcut. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I wouldn't suggest it if you don't want to go to heaven just quite yet. <laughs> so, talking about the Bible, there's another amazing uh, paradox that Jesus was completely a human, but completely God. Yeah. I've always thought that neither of those things can be true because if he was the son of God then obviously he couldn't have been completely human but if he was God then well if he was human then how could he even think that he could understand God he had to be somehow divine in order to understand what he was talking about so, like, neither of those things can be true, and yet both of them need to be true for the story to make any sense at all? Well, monotheism was, was something that a lot of these New Age religions were trying to move away from, okay? You know, right. Judaism was a monotheistic, monotheistic religion, and so was yeah. Zoroastrianism. And yes. then these hip new, you know, uh, cool Christians, or actually I wouldn't even mm -hmm. call them Christians at the time, because Jesus technically wasn't a Christian. Like he, no. Christianity started hundreds of years after he was already yes. gone, you know, so. But uh, he, he was this hip new upcoming, you know, guy who uh, didn't want his beliefs to be monotheistic I guess you know what I mean so so back then the number three was really really uh, spiritual to a lot of people especially to people who were uh, into Gnostic uh, religions and stuff like that yes. who believed that numbers were important you know and yes. uh, 
you you also had well we we've done a a few episodes where we talked about uh what's his face uh he's the well pythagoras pythagoras was yeah. big on that and uh the only reason why he didn't agree with the gnostics and the way that they uh treated the number three three was because of or was because of how they handled the trinity okay he they, they didn't think that they were very good about that you know so um there there was a whole lot going on back then where and me personally it's just, when it comes to a lot of the writings and stuff you you really do have to educate yourself and learn what's going on because there's things in those books that mo- most likely were more inspired by man than by god you know so mm-hmm. indeed uh, so all, all of these things are thoughts and ideas that were going on in people's minds during that time period you know so it's another thing that fascinates me is how a person can write down in a book God says this and this right whatever it is let there be light right and then another person comes along and reads what the other person has written and then believes that God said that thing there's no proof there's no source, there's no argument, there's no convincing. It's just some guy wrote down a statement. The next guy came along and believed it. Mm-hmm. That's what I was saying to you earlier about minds. Goodness, they play, play tricks on us. Well, it happens not just in religion. I mean, here, just a little while ago, you know, robot, he was trying mm-hmm. to debate with me over over aliens you know what I mean ufology and stuff and uh, I'm like dude he's like you got a source for that I'm like are you kidding me dude asking for a source when it comes to ufology is like asking for a source when it comes to freaking you know uh, remote remote viewing I was like come on dude you know what I mean seriously you know and and this has to do with like paranormal and uh, supernatural stuff. It has nothing to do with like religion directly. And mm. he he's uh, tell me a source. You know what I mean? I'm like, what are you oh, talking dude. about, dude? <laughs> you know, I mean, we're talking about stuff that can't be proven yeah. anyhow. So, and and I I think that that's just the way people are. You know, they just they get. They let things get away from with them from themselves. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Don't forget, yes, that these things don't have any proof. <laughs> right. It's how people want to prove things that don't exist. Right. Or may it's, not have existed. I'm not going to say that like it yes. was real Maybe. or not because people get touchy right. about that stuff. You know what I mean? They're they're pretty hardcore. It's very interesting how people use language, Roger. Because for me, I love I love psychology. I love psychology because it's about thoughts. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you put those thoughts into language, something seems to happen in people as if they there's some belief in something that's said. Because you, you you talk about what they were talking about in the Bible and Jesus and this understanding of these numbers and spiritual stuff and, and all that stuff that happened then. It's fascinating. And, and I think that there's a huge message there. I'm not dissing it. But it's not the only group of people, those Middle Eastern people and European people who tried to deal with Judaism and Christianity are not the only pe- groups of people like the Egyptians themselves mm-hmm. spent ages talking about these, uh, the sacrifices of the sun and the, the, the trinity of, of, of mother, father, child, and the, all these very interesting concepts that you find in the Bible. You can find them in Egyptian mythology, you can find them in Sumerian mythology, the Buddhists, the Zens, the 
all these deep dilemmas of human life have been dealt with by different people and different religions. But you dig deep enough and you see that it's the same human angst and anxiety that's mm -hmm. underneath those different words. Yep. It, it gets pretty ridiculous when you uh, know what you're looking for, you know what I mean? And you go through and you... you because see, when I say that, what I'm doing is I'm trying to dis discern information, and it always comes mm -hmm. back to discernment, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So when you're reading through this stuff, and you're looking for stuff that you know just isn't like, it, well, it's not original. It's something that was developed by somebody before them, or you know, mm -hmm. it's an idea that that spurred from a different source than just them you know when you see mm -hmm. that it just over and over again it just kind of makes it to where it confirms to you you know maybe everything you thought that was mm -hmm. real isn't really real you know real yes exactly because i mean that carry on you you were talking about you know uh paradoxes and you know we're, this is about duality uh, ignorance is bliss i mean mm. you know that's, mm. that's another one that, when you that's stop and think one. about it when you stop and think about it is like learning really a good thing or is being ignorant mm. a state of the bliss to where you don't have to yeah. think yeah yeah or is it a false bliss? You think that it's bliss, and then you're like, oh, wow, if only I'd known. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes people don't want to learn. You know, don't, no. there, yeah. there, there's stuff out there that people don't want to know, and the reason why they don't want to know it is because it goes against their beliefs, and it hurts them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So. so do you think, with your, your research that you've been doing in ufology, do you think that the collapse of religion is one of the reasons in the rise of people's interest in alien species? Do you think that we're longing to be connected to something different from us? And now that God is politically incorrect, aliens have sort of taken the place of God. What's your reading of it? Well, for me, um, and I've mentioned this, it was a while back, um, but mm -hmm. I, 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 I honestly believe that like humans were programmed to worship something. There's something in us that tells us we have to worship something. Mm. It could be the, our possessions, it could be food, it could be alcohol and drugs, it could be the U.S. government, it could be, or any government for, you know, reference. It doesn't matter which one. It could be yeah. God, it could, but they have to worship something, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then it just seems to be something that's just programmed into our mind. Be because not too many people are able to freaking say that they don't worship something, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, one thing that I did learn whenever I was doing a lot of my research was how many people who proclaim to be atheists, how they went through a lot of problems with mental issues and and issues oh. like that, like, uh, what's his face, he's the one that, uh, came up with, um, what is it, uh, natural selection and all that, what was his name again? Yeah, Dar Darwin, okay, people don't realize the story with him, like, after his mm -hmm. daughter died is when he started getting real resentful about God, okay, and that's, oh. that's when he started making, like, off- off-color remarks about religion and stuff like that. Um, whereas before that, he actually wanted to get the admira you know, admiration from people who were religious scientists. But right. but then after his daughter died, he actually got uh, pretty 
upset about it and he went through a lot of mental issues because he 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 had to go through a transition where he believed in something and then he stopped believing in something and it oh. it happens to a lot of these people who try to say that they are atheists like there's a part in your brain that tells you man you know because you've been raised up on these beliefs your family's been raised up on these beliefs it's a part of you and you're giving yes. it up you know yes and it, it causes a lot of mental and physical uh problems there's tons of people who claim to be atheists that, that yeah if you just research you'll see that they've they've, they've experienced these problems yeah and just are using different words it's, to try and express this belief that you say is this need for worship. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I really believe that there is something inside the human mind that that is programmed into each of us that tells us we have to worship something. I, I mm. really do believe that. You know, it's dif it's different for me. Okay, I mean, maybe it's not different for me, but my thought process at the moment where I've, I've got to with myself is that I don't want to worship anything. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I want to believe in a God that wants me to worship it. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I don't want to be in involved with that sort of narcissistic weird thing. However, even though I have those feelings that I'm trying to work through and I'm not trying to say I'm right or wrong to have that, that just is a place that I'm at in contemplating God. Mm -hmm. Is that like, why would a God want you to worship them but the other part of it the why I still believe in God even though I have all those questions and doubts and problems is that if I meditate and if I calm my mind and if I come into the presence of God without my preconceived thoughts and without my words and my rational beliefs I feel feel as if I've been changed or helped or encouraged or nurtured. It's just, I have an emotional response to feeling that I am near to God, which is a positive thing for my day. So that's interesting to me. That's a different paradox for me is about how my experience of wanting to be near God is so completely different from my words of trying to describe my experience of what I think about God. You know what that is, don't you? No. It's called Explain the, to me. It's called the sound of silence. Oh? Really? If you, if you want to do little exercises in that uh, type of topic, um, next time when you remember to do it, like turn your TV on and turn the volume down and watch oh, TV yes. with the volume all the way down and you'll, wow. you'll, you'll see you'll see something. Okay, I'll try that. We'll talk about it next time. But just turn the volume down and don't listen to it. Just watch the screen. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll give that a go. That's interesting. But it's all right. So, yeah. It's the sound of silence. That's what it is. They've actually got a song by uh, Simon Garfunkel, I believe, too. Oh, yes, I know that. Yes, I know that song. All right, you mentioned that for some people, um, the government, the U.S. government becomes their god, right? This mm -hmm. made me think of this paradox. Where is it? Yeah. Um, oh, goodness, I can't find it. Here we go. This is known as the Downs Paradox. For a rational, self-interested voter, the cost of voting normally exceeds the expected benefit of voting. And yet, people carry on voting. <laughs> <laughs> So the cost of voting, what exactly are they referring to when they say the cost? Are they talking monetary? Oh, no, I think they're talking emotionally, that ah. you really want your guy to, to win. 
and so you vote for him and you back him and then either he loses or he wins and then doesn't do what he said he would do so you have that huge disappointment once you voted well for me i have the kind of that issue but not because they lose but like i have this part in my brain that says it's a fixed system it's because I'm against political parties, okay, and I've actually done research on it, and I, I don't like the way my government has handed all of the voting over to political parties when they aren't a part of the government, you know what I mean? Yes. But, um, political parties should not have the power to say who gets to be in debates and who doesn't. Everybody should be, be welcome to sure, it, yes. you know? Yes. Um, and that's what they've done and it's turned into a popularity contest now instead of my vote counting all of my votes determines a person who is sitting up in Springfield Missouri who might vote on my behalf okay yes. but for, for me to get my vote to count he's got to get a certain amount of uh, votes and if he doesn't all the votes that he represents gets thrown away yeah yes they're, they're and we all know this and we all hate it and we all know the system is rigged and we all know that the only people who benefit are the politicians mm -hmm. and yet voting happens yeah regularly and and people just do it and I, go along complaining about it but just do it i do it i just what I, what I like this right here is the first in a while I'd say about four months that I've complained about it but I, I do like complaining about my vote and how it sucks and like it's a rigged system I love it I have no problem with complaining about it whatsoever I, I think I, I think it it's something that brings joy to me to to get on the internet and tell people you know what your voting system sucks <laughs> i love that you know more people should do it yes but then once we've said that then we should instantly start talking about decentralization oh, and that's small stuff. i mean come on now <laughs> you know <laughs> hello roger don't stop me don't don't, don't, don't. I've, I've i've had i've heard your your take on decentralization and well you might as well say it because it's just I'm no say it you, it's actually something you really do believe in so you need to I say do believe it. In it. yes so i do believe in it what i believe in is that we don't we don't need to persist in doing something that's not working right the the, the system that we have was a good system and people tried to set it up and it's been subverted and it's been broken and we can't fix it and so we need to walk away from it and we need to do something better and the only thing that we've got better at the moment the only option that we've got at the moment is to rely on the power of the masses the power of the people but we know that the power of the people doesn't work in huge, big um, mobs. And so to counter that, we build small communities, small, diverse communities. So over here, there's a community of green people. And over here, there's a community of blue people. And over here, there's a community of purple people. And all those people are able to bond really closely to each other and make these little decentralized cells where they can fulfill each other's needs. But they also then interact with each other. And so you have small decentralized communities that make bigger decentralized communities that make bigger. And so you have this whole great network effect that then slots into the hierarchies and makes communication between people productive. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's my little spiel, Roger. That's, and, and every time you, you say stuff like that, it reminds me of the Sumerians. That's how they did it. Like, it was city-states. And uh, each uh, city 
had their own gods that they worship, and that, you know, and they had their own form of government. Um, yeah. It, it got to the point where, like, this city worshipped this god, and then if you wanted Whoops. to worship this god, you went over Are you there? here. Yeah, I'm here. Roger? You, yeah, I'm here. Are you? Whoops. Oh, what a pity. Roger has dropped out. No, I haven't. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you're back. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I never. I never went out. Oh. Okay. But, so your volumes you went away. But did you get that last part? We got up to city-states. Yeah, they were city-states, you know what I mean? And, like, each separate city had their own form of government and the gods they worshipped and stuff like that. So I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty cool. I also think that it's interesting that even that system broke down. It's as if with people, or like we're talking about this paradox thing, you, you have to keep on searching. You can't just get a set of, of, of instructions or rules that work forever. You always have this this duality, this push and pull. And mm -hmm. you have to be able to, like we, when we have a big government system like we, we've, we've got that gets to the, the limit of its functioning, then we have to change and make another system knowing that our new system will also get to the limits of its functioning and we're going to have to change again. But that is what we do as people. That's what we do so well as people, is that we think something up, test it out, and then make changes. Think something else up, test it out, and then make changes. Mm -hmm. And doing that has taken us a few thousand years, but look at us. We're really amazing, the way we've tamed this planet. I hope this is quite a hostile planet. I hope that they realize though yeah. on the way that, you know, like we we've actually done quite a bit, you know, don't don't mess it up. Like we've mm -hmm. actually had a better life than a lot of people in the yes. in human history, you know what I mean? Um, so So much better. Yes. Yes. Well that's the important thing is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. And that's another thing, like, you know, I mean, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, how many people <laughs> really sit and just wonder in the back of their head if they could get away with just smacking a baby one time? Well, I would say a lot. You know. Myself. Being honest. Yeah. That, that's, that's the one thing that really makes you stop and think, you know. I mean, like... Because it, it, it just seems like that's what they're doing when they do stuff like what they're doing today. It's like in Indeed. the back of their heads, they're saying, you know, I want to smack that baby right in the face, you know. Exactly. Well, you know, Roger, that in the wild, most baby animals don't make it. Like, for instance, with uh, lions, the, all the little baby, the cubs, are looked after in nurseries. And the lionesses take turns in being the, the, the head of the nursery mm -hmm. and a lot of the disciplining of the babies kills the babies about a quarter of the babies uh, be become adults right. just out of the face because the mom hits it too hard with her paw and that's it bye gone yeah so it is part of a restrained bestial, na an unrestrained bestial nature that, that we have from, yeah, from. Okay, so I have one final paradox that we can quickly discuss before we finish, Roger. Okay. And this starts with uh, the joke about hedgehogs, or porcupines maybe it is. Roger, how do porcupines have sex? I don't know. How do porcupines have sex? Very carefully. That was funny. Yes, it's very funny. And it comes to the, it, it's the basis of the hedgehog paradox. In real life, hedgehogs huddle together to create warmth during cold weather. But they have to remain a certain distance apart because otherwise they will harm each other with their spikes. So they have this need to huddle for warmth, but 
but this need to be a part to avoid harm. Mm -hmm. And this is the dilemma of human relationships. We need each other. We must be with each other. And yet, the closer we are uh, in relationships, the more we can hurt each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes back to that saying of that, the ones that you love the most are the ones that hurt you the worst. Right. So I think that's why lots of people just withdraw from society. Well, it's entanglement too. Like uh, a friend of mine, we used to call him Pappy. He used to explain to us like uh, entanglement. Okay, when you take and you put your hands together like you're praying. Okay, yes. You're you got your hands together right there, and you're 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 bound up right there that's uh you're entangled with one another right and he says a relationship isn't really about being bound up like that what you do is you take your hands and put them side by side and that's two people walking together okay right. now yes. and another thing too is like um mercy okay have you ever mm -hmm. everybody likes using the term mercy but they really don't understand what that means okay like have you ever played mm -hmm. mercy no mercy no, I don't. when you play mercy you take and you put your hands together and you mm -hmm. you the only person that wins at mercy is the one who freaking causes the other one to save mercy oh right so mercy is giving in right mercy okay okay so with mercy uh you have to have uh just get, give in because the great the pain was uh, too great yes okay so that's mercy yes. and 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 uh the whole thing of it is is you don't even have to pet, play mercy you know what i mean you can <laughs> that's the whole thing i mean you don't have to go through pain you don't have to no do any of that so yes that's that's yes. that's kind of what stuck, sticks out to me like uh you know you're walking together you're not entangled in a, a screwed up relationship and there's it's okay yes. to have distance be you know what i mean like you don't right. you don't have to be stuck up each other's butt 24 7. that's exactly and also the other thing is that even though you experience pain in a relationship, it's actually not that big of a deal. Oh, it's, you, it's oh, horrible. You, I, I don't understand terrible. how you guys can even do that stuff. Like, what? Have relationships have re and stuff. Like, <laughs> but we have a relationship, Roger. No, I've walked away from I've relationships for a while. Oh, man. you mean? I, I, I'm, I'm not. The love relationships. No, yeah. I'm, I'm meaning friendships as well. I'm oh, meaning oh, yeah. yeah all, okay. all different sorts. Yeah, no, 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 not just love. No. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, there's a reason why they created marriage, okay? That's a commitment. That's something that people need to be ready for when they get involved in that stuff and that's why the divorce rates have gotten up so much higher is because people don't take that stuff serious seriously yes yes you i know. know but you know even though even if you have this wonderful relationship right and you 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 love marriage say even if you have a wonderful marriage and nothing goes wrong and you just great you still one of those people's going to die and the other person's going to be in severe pain because of losing that person they loved so much. Mm -hmm. So you can't avoid the pain. The more you love somebody, the more the pain is going to be when you lose them to death, if that's, you know, the final loss. Well, you do know that there is another duality to love, right? And this is just real world. Uh... uh experience right here that when it comes to love okay everybody everybody likes the warm fuzzy feelings okay and they they when they feel those feelings that's love but when you lose somebody it could be because of death it could be because somebody broke up with you or divorced you or whatever that's still love too okay feeling that pain means that you actually love that person if if you didn't feel that pain then that means you didn't love them yeah so, so love is also, love 
love is also the good feelings as well as the bad feelings, you know, so. Yeah, it's very interesting. It is. Well, that has been a fantastic discussion today. There are so many more things that we can say, but I think that we should restrain ourselves, save some more material for next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Roger, thank you very much indeed for being with me today. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. And um, do you have any final words to sign off with? No, nothing. No? Just goodbye. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so until next week, we're done here. Thanks for listening, guys. And we'll see you same time next week. Goodbye.